welcome to the Woven Energy Podcast on Real Practical Shamanism with me, Joseph Sykora and Damon Smith. We are here once again to talk about shamanism from the ground up. And in this episode, post the gathering of the tribe, our Patreon um, kind of gathering that where we explored all sorts of wonderful things shamanism related, we are going to answer the question, can you learn shamanism from a podcast? So Damon, how are you doing, man? Uh, very good, mate. Very tired, very happy. The What I'm happy about is indeed the gathering of the tribe. I mean, the, the turnout was absolutely spectacular. So, you know, patrons... Well, what was the gathering of the tribe? So gathering of the tribe was... Uh, originally, we were going to get together physically in Austria, and we were going to get all of the... I don't know what do you call them, the, the patrons... Patrons that are uh, engaged with the podcast, uh, are heavily engaged with the podcast, together in one physical place and do a bunch of different sessions on different aspects of shim- shamanism, mainly mm. spirit dance and chil- physical chilisty, but we also did some stuff around drum that went down pretty well and also have discussions particularly about the future of the podcast, uh, which I think we're going to talk around a little bit, so we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Mm. I um, am delighted and happy by the turnout. More than half of all of our patrons made at least one session on that. Yeah, That's just just to, just to clarify, instead of being in a physical location, we changed that to being online in a, in right. a definitely a more interactive way than perhaps just listening to a podcast. So yeah. it was much more of a you know very interactive. Uh, we did it on Zoom, or you did That's it right. on Zoom. That's right. Um, and um, the feedback was pretty good, right? Uh, feedback was good, but also the, t- the the turnout was spectacular. I mean, thinking about it, you know, if we go back to those days when we first talked about doing this podcast, mm. um, uh, we actually had more people on the gathering of the tribe than I expected to get listeners for the Woven Energy podcast <laughs> when we started out. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. just amazing. I was so grateful to our patrons, uh, our tri- the tribe, as we call them. Uh, I guess me and you are in the tribe as well, so it's our tribe. And um, and yeah, you guys were spectacular. You made the event, uh, you know, more than it could have been. It wasn't just me talking and demonstrating. There was a lot of interactivity on it. We had some great discussions and, and some great input from uh, the attendees. So thanks ever so much to everybody who came. Uh, for the patrons who didn't manage to make it, that's that's totally cool. But, do, you know, this is now an annual event. That's the inaugural one. Gathering of the Tribe 2023 was focused on physical chalicity and spirit dance. We've already decided Gathering of the tri- Tribe 2024 will be around drum technique. So there's still an opportunity next year to come and join. It was seven, seven sessions over seven days. It was a bit of a marathon because I'm working very, very hard at Cambridge University on multiple projects simultaneously at the moment. <laughs> it was a bit of a marathon for me, but I was so glad we did it. Uh, it, it turned out great as far as I'm concerned. It was so an achievement. And, and I think, yeah. I think to be honest, um, probably got more out of it being this kind of an, an arrangement rather than being in a physical place because it would be for less sure. time. Um, we could explore more options. Uh, and am I right in saying that if you are not a patron right now and you feel like you may want to uh, see a few of these sessions. Are they available in Patreon to a certain level of patron? Um, yeah, I can think... they access those previous recordings? So the so the recordings, the sessions were recorded. We said we'd put, stick them in Patreon or Patreon if if the recordings came out all right. The recordings did come out all right. That's the good news. I'm busy editing them, and they are appearing there one at a time. And I mm-hmm. think. You can you can get access to them from the I think it's the five dollar level or something, um, the, right? The the one above, you know. Thank you on the podcast. So so yeah, yeah. I think- and to be clear as well, all you need to be is a patron. You you didn't charge any money for this ga- actual gathering for the week gathering. This was just for no no no. Correct? Should we? No should we? I mean, if if we'd held yeah. it in a physical location, obviously we would have had to pay for facilities and all that kind of stuff. But because yeah. it was online, there was no reason to. I mean, our patrons already support us. Uh, we've got some great recording equipment uh, and things like that um, from the support of the, from the financial support the patrons provide. But to me, the thing that, that's happy about I, I was very, very happy about was the the level of input 
uh, an effort from the patrons at the event. Seven events over seven days. The attendance was just amazing. Uh, so thanks ever so much, guys. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, cool. So if you do want to see those recordings, uh, just, to, just to put some context around it, um, the topics covered was mainly spirit dance, right? Uh, there was there was yeah, two or three sessions all on the spirit dance, and also what's really good is that if you're a long time listener of the podcast, and perhaps you get a little bit frustrated now and again that we, it's always a description through the movements, as is inevitable being a audio podcast, it does put those into context because you went pretty much from the beginning talking about the various techniques that we talk about on the podcast, but you could actually see them being done. Um, and guide yes. us through the actual movements. And so it does add a layer and a level to perhaps, or, or a context to perhaps what you've listened to on the podcast. So, you know, it's there for you. So there's a bit more than that, actually, because I could see what people had been practicing. I was, I was, you know, pleasantly surprised, you know, talking about the question, what can you learn from our podcast? I mean, several people were doing this stuff along with me on the video feed, and and sort of showing the level of practice they've got to already, and I, I was I was gobsmacked how good some of it is. Um, I'm mm. not going to pick out individuals. You know who you are. Uh, I don't want to flatter some and not others. Um, but the the stuff that I saw was was really brilliant. And and you know, to the question, can you learn shamanism from a podcast? Was well, some people have. So that's the. Uh, that, yeah. that's a that's a positive starting point right and it's uh, something that you've yeah. come to uh, come to uh change your mind on right <laughs> uh, yeah well I, I think i think it's uncle joe had changed my mind very gradually for a long <laughs> period of time i mean you changed my mind about doing the podcast i mean just just quickly fi- shout out a few of the patrons for different reasons it's just people who've either upped their subscription level or yeah. um signed up recently so we got thanks ever so much to ben uh, returning patron, good to have you back, pal. Uh, really great. Um, we got a uh, kung fu fan. Um, thanks, kung fu fan. Uh, we got the the uh, very well known Graham Barlow, who's uh supporting us uh, as a patron as well as as a content creator. That's amazing, mate. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, and Emily, uh, long term patron, has uh, upped her support for us, which is amazing. And, and you know, all of our patrons, you guys are superstars. Uh, total, total revelation in my life, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but go and, and also, go for, go for also it. to mention that the the um, the the patron the Patreon. Uh, being a patron I, actually welcomes you into the family of podcasts that we have here, right? A Woven Energy, Woven Energy. This is the this is the original podcast, the Woven Energy yeah. podcast. This is this is where we come to learn shamanism, but we also it's an umbrella for several other interesting podcasts as well. well there's you've four. got the um, there's four podcasts. You've got the Energy Arts podcast. You've got a Heretics podcast, the Woven Energy podcast, and uh, what's the fourth one? Pigs and Chickens, is it? Pigs and Chickens, yeah, yeah. Which is yeah, the Agile cool. the Agile podcast. It's like uh, business. Were, shamanism were, in business. Shamanism <laughs> in business, yeah. So yeah. in terms of the podcast, I mean, obviously, compared to Wolf and Angie and Heretics, the other two podcasts are quite small in terms of numbers of listeners. Uh, I encourage you to go and listen to them. You might find them more interesting than you think you're going to. For instance, our latest episode on energy arts is uh, it's the most controver- one of the most controversial subjects we've ever done, which is Aikido versus Muay Thai, uh, which is a pretty, uh, I don't know, it's almost a clickbait title, isn't it? You know, um, But I think it's quite interesting. And, and obviously the pigs and chickens, for anybody who's remotely involved in or- organizations, anything like that, and working within organizations, that should be very interesting. Uh, but it's all. I might need to start shamanic... listening to that myself because I'm so uh, the level that I'm at now in my business. I need some organisation tools or something to help with my yeah, everyday yeah. life, and you know I'm looking into things like that. So yeah. that'd be really cool to check it out. And uh, um, our two, but I'm at the Woven Energy podcast on shamanism and Heretics by Woven Energy are like the two flagship podcasts. They're far and away the most popular podcasts out of the four. Um, and, um, yeah, so I guess that's, that's where we're at with it. Um, and there's an awful lot of listening on those two podcasts, uh, which is another thing, you know, I mean, some of our, some of our patrons, uh, and long-time listeners have listened to all of the episodes of both podcasts more than once, 
which yeah. is which is quite shocking given that there's well over 100 hours of listening there. <laughs> so it's sort of like, <laughs> I think some people listen to the three times, I had 300 hours of listening, you know. And I think you can because they're quite dense. You can you can get an awful lot by m- multiple listenings to them. But one of the things that did oh, come sure. up, one of the things that did come up on the Gathering of the Tribe, though, is that especially the the, the main podcast, it's not really the main one because Heretics is also very popular. But the, the Heretics podcast on shamanism, sorry, the, the Woven Energy podcast on shamanism, is a, unlike Heretics, is a sequential podcast. I mean, on Heretics, yeah. we have our alchemy tutorial, and you have to do that in order. And we have a few other things you listen to in order. But in general, Heretics is a much more dip into subjects you're interested in. Whereas Woven Energy, it's like start at episode one and then start working forwards until you get to episode 67. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. So one of the things that came up at the Gathering of the Tribe is how are we going to make this podcast in particular more accessible to new people coming along. Obviously, when we only had one episode, it was very accessible to new people because it was obvious where, yeah. the, you know what I mean? It was obvious where yeah, to go. Yeah. Uh, now yeah. you have to scroll down a very long way to get to the starting point. Well, well, know? to be honest, that is a question that we've tried to address time and time again. And we're well aware of that question. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been in the background ever since we got quite a way into the podcast, particularly when we got to stage two and three. And it's like, gosh, now we're on stage four, where it's intense, for a lack of a better word. Um, and it's very deep. And and and, and it's like, it, it's built on a foundation of understanding that you need for the previous levels and the previous episodes. And now we're at that stage. It's like, well, how do you, how do we keep new listeners coming in? And how do yeah. we look after those listeners because we don't want to reject those listeners at all. We don't want to have a feeling of, uh, you know, it just far too intimidating. It wants to be a, a nice, relaxing, manageable kind of environment for people to come into. So yes. totally, totally need to need to address it. And uh, So and we also we had some it. volunteers from among the patrons. Thanks, guys. You know who you are to have a crack at something like that. I mean, I think the, the general consensus was we need to do something a little bit additional. Uh, maybe like a mm-hmm. tiny little introductory course or something like that, you know, yep. that, that we can put on wovenengy.com website. And it's sort of maybe like a couple of videos or something. You know, watch these before you listen to the, or, or you know, a couple of audio yeah, records or, or before you listen to, to the yeah. podcast and, yeah. and talk about what it's about. Yeah. Because obviously the people who've been listening to the podcast since the beginning or near the beginning, they've sort of grown up along with it. But we're talking about new people arriving. I just imagine what it would be like for somebody who, you know, hadn't yet learned a great deal about shamanism and jumping into one of the level four episodes. <laughs> it was like, what on earth yeah. is this about? You know, so so yeah, uh, we need to uh, sort of so we'll give ourselves to the gathering of the tribe twenty four to get that resolved um, to come up with something concrete along those lines. But we do intend to do that. Yeah. Well, I've got three points here. Um, I do actually really like the idea. Of, uh, what, what, well. The idea of extending the website idea with a few videos, um, because I I thought, well, like what, what we could do is potentially devote like 15, 20 seconds at the beginning of each each episode to guide people to perhaps the best episodes to listen to if they're just starting out. It's like, look, guys, don't worry about this episode. If you've come to us brand new, check out XYZ, check out episodes, you know, eight, seven, eight, and nine, for instance. That's a yeah, really yeah. good place to to start, or, you know, right from the beginning of the podcast. Um, but, you know, grounding in chelicity. And, and so we can we can try and lay lay the bed so to speak in the episodes and go you know don't worry about it here's some episodes that you can listen to to get up to date or you know relatively up to date um and also something that we've talked about several times which is weaving in these general interest episodes um yeah for sure the the slightly more not necessarily deep dive into shamanic technique but just sort of the the interesting um, nuggets around yeah. what shamanism is and talking about those as, as sort of like little waypoints because some of those are fascinating. I know yeah. that's what drew me to shamanism, you know, with us sitting in our, sitting in that living room uh, at the end of certain yeah, sessions. And we and have done about... quite a few like that. I mean, for instance, the one that sticks to mind is the one we did on the events uh, yeah. early, early on. That was a really good episode and we should do more like that. I mean, it's one of the things that's worked with heretics Heretics started yeah. several years after Woven Energy, but actually it's picked up a following 
Uh, and I think because of that, there's a whole bunch of stuff. There's bound to be something on heretics that interests you somewhere in all the smorgasbord mm. of, you know, <laughs> topics that, we, that we've covered on there. Uh, yeah. it, there's bound to be, you know, and I think that's why, you know, listenership wise, it's done quite well. Um, and so we try to em- we're going to try to emulate that a bit on energy arts as well. We started off just mostly talking about Aikido and how to fix it. But over time, you know, we pretty quickly came to the conclusion that we want to talk about all energy arts. So we'll be talking about Xing Yi and Baji and Tai Chi and, you know, all, just everything, Qigong, yoga, whatever. Uh, we, our intention is to talk about all that stuff um, and hopefully, you know, take a, a bit of a lesson from the success of Heretics. Uh, and maybe we could do more like that on the main podcast than we have been doing rather than just ploughing through endless level four episodes. Well, it's, it, it, yeah. well exactly. But it's a, it's a balance, isn't it? Because, um, mm. you know, we've talked about this so many times. It's just, how do you do it? And so yeah. perhaps, um, perhaps uh, something we could do is perhaps taking a little break from stage four and going, right, for the next six episodes, for instance, just off the top of my head, right, these six episodes are going to be the introduction to shamanism episodes. Yeah. And we can devote, we can devote six, six, eight episodes, however long it takes to just the absolute basics. Yeah, that, that's go, that's tempting. I mean, I think something along those lines, perhaps not a block, not a block of six words, because for the people who are getting on with this stuff, for the people who are doing quite well with it, who, as I saw on the, as I saw hmm. at the, the gathering of the tribe, I don't want to hold those guys up. So I think a mixture is great. Even if it was just we yeah. disciplined, we'd do every, even if it was just every other episode, we'd do a level four and then we do a general interest and then we do a level four and we do a general interest. I mean, from my personal yep. point of view, I'm, I'm quite excited that we're cracking th- through quite a few level four episodes because I so want to get on to Animal Spirit Dance. And mm. we don't need to do 64 level <laughs> four episodes before we get on to Animal Spirit Dance. You know, yeah. maybe eight. Maybe we could do it after eight. We can start introducing some animal spirit dance, which is which is something that I want to talk about a lot on this podcast and I have wanted to talk about a lot for a long period of time. Just spirit animals in general. Uh, it's such yeah. a fascinating subject and it's so core to what we do. Uh, and we're getting tantalizingly close. I mean, it's taken a long time. It's taken nearly 70 episodes to get where we are, but <laughs> but we're not, you know what I mean? So I, I do want to keep the level four stuff going, but maybe how about every other episode we do a general interest now? hundred uh, percent. Yeah, yeah. We've like got that. a document, haven't we? Full of general interest episode yeah, ideas. Yeah. So let's start ticking them For off. For sure. For sure. Yeah, definitely. So going back to that. those early, early days, you know, I guess if we have the working title for this particular podcast is Can You Learn Shamanism from a Podcast? When when we started discussing this issue back then, I mean, what years were those? Were they like early 2000s or something? I try, I'm trying to think of maybe mid to I can't remember when it was. It was so well, long ago. Are you, are you talking about when we first started talking about the podcast? Yeah, when we first started talking because about the podcast. Um, or was it later than that? Around, that would have been around 2013... 2013. 2013. Okay, that's that time period. Around that. Around that. Yeah, kind yeah, of time. yeah. And the stuff, but the stuff that led up to it, the whole Arma Bella movement and all that kind of stuff had been going. I thought, oh, that's right. 2011. 2011 yeah. was the was the official sort of, I don't know if you call it official, but it was the date on which we thought we got somewhere with Arma Bella. Uh, I remember that in yeah. particular because that was the year my dad died, so it sticks in my head. Um, yeah. And that, incidentally, Armabella was the part of the Armabella thing was coming up with all the terminology that we use, the English sounding terminology that we used to talk about shamanism. So, you know, things like the, the names of the energy changes, like Jag and Mir and Gaia Mel, and Squall yeah. and stuff, Mel, all that Point, stuff. Yeah. And also just words like Chalisti and stuff like that. We wanted a, a vocabulary that we could talk about this stuff in English or English sounding terms. And that was that the Armabella was m- movement effort was part of pulling that together. But then coming up to when Joe started talking to me about the podcast, it, it we all, we sort of started the podcast long before we ever started recording it, didn't we? We used to sit in that cafe sometimes. <laughs> we, used to, Just, we used to sit in the cafe also, uh, yeah, before training. And we used to, I mean, that was still in the Armabella days. And, and I have a very keen fondness for the Armabella days. Um, there was, it, it's so fascinating because at the time, 
you were so against talking about shamanism. Of course, you were talking about shamanism from the Arthur mm -hmm. Bella perspective, but from yeah. from your point of view, you always wanted to wrap it up in this sort of uh, yeah. exterior bubble to try and get the ideas across in a more in what you perceive to be a more digestible way. Yeah. Um, and it's really funny because I remember I remember finally getting you to talk about actual shamanism. And I don't think I ever told you about this, uh, but there were times where we would be on the phone together and it would be like hour, an hour, hour long phone calls. And I would try and prod you to talk about shamanism. <laughs> and this was before the podcast. So I had yeah. you on the phone on speaker and I had a little dictaphone recording the actual <laughs> phone call just for my own, you know, just so I could have a log of some of this stuff. And then finally yeah. I thought, you know what? Maybe, maybe I can do some of this stuff that Damon's been teaching me on Damon himself yeah, yeah. and get him to do all this on an actual podcast. And do you remember, yeah. we actually did it on YouTube to start with. We tried to, we desperately tried to get the whole camera thing going and it just wasn't happening. Yeah, um, yeah. It just wouldn't behave. And then we just gave up and just went, nah, it's fine. We'll actually, do, a, we'll do I an think audio the, podcast. the long format of the podcast, we also talked about that, didn't we? Should we do a little short podcast or should we do long format? The long, long format, format all has the way. helped long really well. Has, yeah. that, that was the right decision. I think, and I don't think that short format we would have ended up with anybody being able to do what we were talking about, frankly. So, so I think that, you know, one of the things is there's often a desire to see the stuff. And, you know, a lot of people, I guess, were pleased to see the stuff um, at the Gathering of the Tribe. But I'm at the Gathering of the Tribe also had people that demonstrating the stuff to me never having actually seen it with their eyes and, and yep. doing a really good job of it. So <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah. So it's um it's it's quite interesting that I think because of the depth of long format, that you can really get into the the heart of things, the nitty gritty uh yeah. of of what you of the topic, that, that people can kind of pick it up a bit by osmosis. And because you know ultimately it's not me and you teaching people shamanism. It's just us encouraging people to go and get taught shamanism by the person they should be getting taught by, which is Mother Nature, uh, mm -hmm. and giving some ideas about how that could be done. And there's no rights and wrongs in that. I mean, the only wrong really is is the whole imagination trap stuff. Uh, the, the only wrong is you start imagining things. Uh, anything else you try that puts you in a, a situation where nature is teaching you directly and there's nothing human intervening in that, that's what the chelicity is all about. You you are effectively applying shamanic technique. You can, of course, take the benefit of people who've been doing it a long time and the techniques that they've either picked up off others or figured out for themselves or that kind of stuff. But it is that kind of a subject. So I do think that you can learn shamanism from podcasts, uh, given given the not not because of the wonderfulness of the podcast format particularly. But because of the wonderfulness of nature uh, as a teacher, mm. uh, it's a very different concept because, you know, in for instance, in the martial arts, we have this concept of lineage, you know, where such and such a person learned off such and somebody else who learned off somebody else who learned off somebody else. It's a very Confucian kind of idea, you know, a very hierarchical kind of idea. And you, you get, yeah. you get there's some upsides to that. There's some downsides. It's nice to feel part of a tradition. I mean, for instance, the Xingyi tradition. It's a long tradition, and it's nice to feel part of that with all those great masters, you know, Li Neng Rang and Ji Long Feng, and all those guys going back into the into the distant past. Uh, at least compared to where we are, it's nice to feel part of that. But then the negative is also you can bask in the glory of your famous teacher or your famous teacher's teacher or your famous teacher's teacher's teacher. You know, uh, and mm. that's like laurel resting. You know, so what if your teacher's teacher's teacher was wonderful? He might have been the greatest thing since sliced bread. But actually, if you can't do it yourself, <laughs> what is it? Yeah, what does yeah, it matter? Yeah. You know, and the, the the damage I feel that Confucianism have done to the, especially the Chinese martial arts, but also the martial arts of other countries, is um, is not inconsiderable, uh, and it's it's gives rise to a, a lot of um, sort of wrong headedness in things, whereas. Nobody's got an older teacher than a shaman, you know. The the teacher of a shaman is nature. Nature, you know, 
best estimates, what, 13 billion years old or something like that, you know. Uh, the, the old <laughs> martial arts master who's 98 with a white beard sort of pales in comparison to the age of every to shaman the in the world, yeah. <laughs> you know. So, so and it, it's, it's quite interesting in terms of what a shaman is. I picked out, just because we're going to talk about this on this episode, I've built, uh, most people are fam- kind of familiar with the fact that I'm a big fan of Terence McKenna. Uh, you know, you're also probably well aware that I wouldn't agree with Terence McKenna. I never managed to meet him, uh, unfortunately. I would have loved to have met him but um, before he passed. But the um, I, I do like a lot of the things that he has to say about Shemnism. This quotation is, is really cool to me. It's actually from a song lyrics that you can find it on YouTube. It's called Re-Evolution. It was a collaboration that he did with the 90s band called The Shaman, uh, who did that mm. famous number one, Ebenezer Good. He's a no good Ebenezer God. Super subtle song that was. Uh, but this is a much, much better song. Uh, not, not more catchy, but it's cool. And this is a little quotation from it. He says, this is what shamanism has always been about. A shaman is someone who's been to the end. It's someone who knows how the world really works. And knowing how the world really works means to have risen outside, above, beyond the dimensions of ordinary space-time and casuistry, and actually seen the wiring under the board, stepped outside the confines of learned culture and learned and embedded language into the domain of what Wittgenstein said the, called the unspeakable, the transcendental presence of the other. So basically what he's saying is, what, what I, I've described this in much more mundane terms as a shaman being like a mechanic. The average person mm. who buys a car just wants it to get them to work or let take them to do their shopping, and they just want the thing to work, right? But mm. mechanics are different. Mechanics want to know... Like, normal people are more concerned with the outside of the car, what's outside the, the bonnet or hood of the car. Whereas the mechanic's more concerned about what's under the hood. And that's just what a shamanism was... A shaman, a shaman is with respect to nature... A shaman is what somebody who wants to know how the world really works, what goes on under the hood of mm. nature. And he talks about um, how history, uh, in the same song, he, has, he talks about history representing a radical break from the nature that preceded it. This is what, you know, we can see this clearly. The start of this song is in our split between our two podcasts. The Woven Energy podcast is what went on before we invented history and civilization and all those kind of things. And it must be the response to a kind of attractor that lies out in our future. It says persistent Persistently, Western religions have integrated into their theologies the notion of a kind of end of the world. And he talks about shamanistic experience kind of confirming this intuition. But it doesn't mean it's going to happen like anything in the, you know, the book of Revelations or anything like that. It's not that kind of a cataclysm. What it really is, you know, the, the Bible talks about it in terms of the Alpha and the Omega. It's what it really is as a, a Shamans take an end-to-end view. They don't look at the here and now. They don't look at this single point in time. Uh, Like most people do, they take the broader view from the very beginning all the way through to the end. But the end, in a way, in shamanism is a cyclical subject. The end is the beginning. And it's so it's not like an exoteric religion where, you know, there's this wonderful world and then all of a sudden it explodes or something. It's nothing like that at all. It's about, he, he talks about the echoes of that dwell point. Uh, if I quote it, it's almost, he talks about this this point of transcendence out there in the future. It's, it, he, but it also it's that point all the way in the past. It's the same point, the beginning of the universe. It's almost as though this object, this is a quotation, this object in hyperspace, glittering in hyperspace, throws off reflections of itself, which actually ricochet into the past, illuminating, illuminating this mystic inspiring, uh, that, that saint or visionary. Basically, what he's saying is the dwell, the dwell point in the future is throwing off echoes of itself, rippling back into the past and illuminating our world 
But my point here is that given the cyclical nature of nature, that dwell point in the future is also a dwell point in the past that's giving off echoes of itself down through the generations. So in this song, McKenna is talking about the exact same thing that we often have on this podcast, you know, that the energy changes being the, the echoes or reflections of the fundamental energy changes or interactions that went on in the beginning of the universe. And those things have echoed down through the generations, not just to be available to us at our point in time, but literally to create our world, to create our manifest, to create our now for us. And this is the kind of stuff that shamans are interested in. And it's just quite interesting reading the lyrics of this song that were actually written Mm. by McKenna himself. Uh, The music was from the shaman. That that he's taken, he's basically given the same concept that, that Mickey did. I mean, Mickey talk about the the different instruments of the creation, instruments like as in musical instruments of the creation, which are the changes. And we these are the level four things that we started talking about on these level four episodes. But it's interesting that McKenna in this case is talking about the dwell point at the end, the omega rather than the alpha. Um mm-hmm. very interesting. But it's the same concept, right? And it's it's quite interesting to to think about or to experience how that is a bi-directional thing that the 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 universe being cyclical, the changing of the seasons, you know, just in the hedgerows now, I love it around here in the, in the springtime. All those little flowers, blue orchids and the, the yellow flowers and the white flowers and all the stuff, the little blue belt and everything that come up in the hedgerows around this time of year, it's just spectacular. Uh, it's a, it's basically a, Conwell is a, it's a shamanist's dream, <laughs> absolute shamanist's mm. dream around this time of year. But, but it is. And, and so the thing is that, that's and, and that that doesn't define what a shaman does. I mean, shamans that help people basically to act as a guide to deal with to help the people around them. It's not a it's not an extended thing. It's to help the people around them um, to to live their lives not in better ways, but basically in, in strategically more able ways. A shaman was very much a strategist of a of a tribal society. And I think that is sort of what we've been doing with the podcast. The shamanism is not a leader. They're not a boss. They're not a manager. They're just somebody who just has been along this path a little way ahead, not a lot ahead, mm. just a little way ahead of other people and and can give, the, I guess, the benefit of that experience, um, but but not to be duplicated. You don't want to walk in the, you know, if you think about walking along a path, the shamanic path, you don't want to walk in the footsteps of shamans who went before you. They can kind of help you head in a good direction. But if you walk exactly in their footsteps, nothing new is coming. There's no there's no artistry in the shamanism. There's no development. There's no growth. And nature is all about growth but, and, and change and adaptivity, adaptiveness. That, that's what nature is all about. So. The question is, in what ways can a shaman who's a little bit further down that path uh, help a shaman who isn't quite so far down that path? And it's not like any of us are anywhere near as far down that path as people like Mickey, right? It's just not, Mm. you know, she was considerably further down the path, probably, you know, past the next village and round the corner, you know, whatever. (laughs) But the, the, the point is, how can we help it? First of all, to the wonder of that, but this is more about what animism is. We talked about this early on the podcast as well, the difference between shamanism and animism. Animism, shamanism is a, is a, a, a shaman is a, a, a spiritual specialist in, a, in an animistic society, the joy of animism. Shamanism is not always a joy. Some of it's dangerous, unpleasant, not all of it, but some of it's dangerous and unpleasant, but shamanism is a specialist the shaman is a specialist role within animist societies. Animism is wonderful. You know, just reveling in nature and all the wonder that nature has to give to us, little flowers in the hedgerows included. That's that's something that a, a shaman wants to bring other, generally wants to bring other people along to. And so the question is, what are the ways in which a shaman can do that? Obviously, the, the sort of, traditional i don't know if it's traditional but the the way that people think in their minds is you know 
There's the shaman in his hut. Somebody in his tribe starts having the shaman sickness, which we would in, in civilized society would probably be called mental illness. And the shaman sort of takes that person into the hut and takes them on as an apprentice and guides them through curing themselves of the shaman sickness. As people would see it, they're not actually curing themselves of it. The shaman sickness, in, in many ways, gives you an advantage, not a disadvantage, and anybody can become a shaman. It doesn't have to be somebody with a natural leaning towards it, though such people certainly do exist. It, it's more like... How does that typically present itself? You mentioned mental illness, but what, what actually is the shaman sickness? The, the most... What, how, how would that, in, in today's society, how would that be viewed well i do know a couple of people who've been through that so i got quite um uh, one of one of whom was was at the gathering of the tribe but the the most common there are many ways that it would be uh interpreted by you know modern psychology or modern psychiatry uh, that i don't necessarily agree with so i don't want to go into that that's a subject for heretics i mean the whole Freudian, Jungian tradition is something we need to get onto on heretics. I mean, we have done some alchemy and those guys pinched an awful lot of stuff from alchemy, not in a good way. I think we might have mentioned it once or twice. So we'll get onto that on heretics. But in general, typical symptoms would include uh, hallucinations, either seeing things, what people would interpret as the person having hallucinations, seeing things, hearing things, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Visions and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and generally, one of the ways to know if it's genuine or not is how enthusiastic they seem about it. Yeah, if if there's quite you know if if they've seen Mother Mary, and they think it's really cool, the other behaving like they think it's really cool that they've seen Mother Mary, and you know, um, they they seem very sort of in religious awe of the experience and all that kind of stuff. Generally, that's even imagined or fake. Um, People who have the genuine shaman sickness, it's called a sickness for a reason. And first of all, I want to make clear here, very, very clear, because I don't want to reinforce stupid misconceptions that are out there in the shamanic community. You do not need to have go through shamanic sickness in order to become a shaman. It's not necessary, mm. even to become a great shaman. You can become every bit as good a shaman as someone who has been through that. It's not that. It's more that that kind of sickness gives people a propensity towards this kind of stuff. That's all. Um, they still need to work at it. And in some ways, they've got more challenges to deal with early on because if if you are a relatively, I don't know what you call it, ordinary person, I guess like me, when I started out in this stuff, you have all of that wrestling with the visions and, and the hallucinations and all that kind of stuff. You have that to come on later in your journey, much later in your journey. As If you have the shaman sickness, you have to deal with it day one. <laughs> That's a... Which is not, it's not the right place to deal with it in many ways. And in a logical sense, the sequence of learning shamanism, that's something you want to be dealing with at level five stroke six, not level one, you know. So the, it's really interesting because um, I'm not going to say who, but somebody I know um, had that uh, in, and not in, a, not in a good way. You know, the, yeah. the, 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 the hallucinations, the, the voices and hearing voices and stuff. Mm. And um, yeah, in modern. Well, if it's like distressing, say, it's just... if it's distressing to them, that's usually the genuine. Yeah. If they don't find oh, it distressing, yeah. then it's generally not genuine. It was distressing yeah. and it was also distressing in the way that nobody would believe this said person either, you yeah. know, and, and so, it like um they'd be either cast aside or you know not not really taken seriously. Or, yeah, yeah, I mean the, the what we get to do as shamans who are following a nice, you know, like like the Woven NG podcast lays out a nice staged path of seven stages if you want to call it seven you call it three whatever number you want a nice even path of gradually acquiring shamanic ability over a long period of time you can deal with those things in a measured sense there's no leaps of faith at any point what are you dealing with big part of what you're dealing with is the miasma that's why we started the heretics podcast right a big part of you is what you're dealing with is the miasma i mean we've often talked about the negative effect that being involved in shamanism has on friends and family they start to see you in a different way the especially because of the social perceptions the the very very wrong-headed perceptions about shamanism that exist in society they start to think there's something up or wrong because effectively because you're not conforming or you're radically yeah. not conforming the thing with the shaman sickness is it whacks that into your face hard 
your perception of reality and the socially acceptable perception of reality are instantly totally at odds with each other. Um, and I I think the, the path that we lay out on the Wolf 90 podcast, if you have a choice, which you don't always, if you have a choice, is a much better way to deal with it. You're you're progressing at a rate where you can gradually build up the toughness. Remember we said bat, you know, bat the Mongolian word. Shamans mm. need that. You can, over a period of time, build up the spiritual toughness that you need in order to deal with the miasma clash, for want of a better word, as your as your shamanic ability progresses. And it's a bit like, you know, if you think of that in terms of learning martial arts, one of the things that we... Um, we do in, in, in Xing Yi, for instance, pick a martial art. One of the things that, that I like about Xing Yi's approach is it teaches you a very strong defense very early. And that's good because Xing Yi's a heavy hit in art. And you're going to be expected at some point in your Xing Yi career to deal with some serious power incoming uh, in terms of strikes, very, very heavy strikes incoming. And the order that the art teaches is first the ability to deal with those strikes and then the ability to deliver them, which to me is exactly the right way around. And that's kind of what those seven stages, that's another way to think of those seven stages is dealing with the ability to deal with what's coming at stages six and seven, five, six and seven, uh, laying a strong foundation, a, 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 a strong foundation of chelicity, a strong foundation of Amsker ability. Uh, then a strong foundation of shamanic technique, and then a strong foundation within the weave, within the weave within nature. Uh, those those foundations set you in really good stead for when the inevitable happens and that sort of stuff that is inflicted on the poor souls who undergo shaman sickness early. Um, when you have to deal with that, you're dealing it with a strong toolkit rather than a, a very very weak one. Because what, who else is there to prepare you if you haven't had the training or guidance of a shaman? Who else is there to prepare you for that clash? There's only yourself. You have to figure it out for yourself in those circumstances, and that's not a pleasant thing. You know, our societies, they're not old. They've developed only over the last 10,000 years. But 10,000 years is is a, a lot longer than the short, young, the, 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 the life of a young person trying to figure all this stuff out for themselves. And I think that's why a shaman is much better described as a guide than a teacher, because nobody can teach that other than nature. Um, and you know, one of the ways to one of the ways to be a shaman in this world is, you know, just everybody you meet, you know, try to get closer to nature. Try to put yourself in a place where nature is teaching. And just say that over and over again. It's a very, very simple approach, but maybe maybe you'll be able to, uh, to persuade a few people to do it that way. But obviously. I think people expect a bit more than that. And the question is then how we how we go about giving them that. So in terms of that traditional model, a person who goes shaman sickness or just has a natural propensity to it, or the shaman just thinks they're conscientious. In some cultures, they will harangue the shaman until they take him in. You know, that's another one. That was a bit like me with a lot of my martial arts training and, uh, and, and eventually shamanic training as well. It's just keep haranguing the shaman until he eventually <laughs> takes you in. Uh, <laughs> You want to tell if a shaman's genuine. Another one is, you know, you really, really have to keep hassling him <laughs> before yeah. teach anything. Uh, Joe had that with me to a certain extent. I was uh, going to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, I, I had the same experience. But, and and it, it's good because you it, teaching someone shamanism or, or guiding somebody with shamanism is a big undertaking. There's a lot involved in it. Uh, just like the, all the effort we put into this podcast, so Joe and I and, and Graham, uh, and and more likely, Tamo and Terry have put into building up these four podcasts. It's a lot of effort, uh, especially when you know it's not the thing that we're doing to earn a living. Any of us, um, it's mm. we, we have to earn a living as well. It's it's a lot of effort, uh, and so it's a big undertaking. So you have to, and this in a way you have to um, be judicious where you put the relatively small amount of time and effort that you've got. Because a shaman also still has to do the job of being a shaman, right? So where you put that effort, and obviously a shaman doesn't want to waste a lot of effort uh, talking to someone who's just going to, you know, or, or encouraging somebody who's just going to just waste it and not go on and ultimately pass that on to somebody else. I mean, to me, what I'm very hopeful for is our our, our when I say hardworking, I mean that the patrons who are really studying hard, this stuff hard, 
but a lot of them are, a lot of you guys are. Um, I really, really hope you guys are going to pass this on to somebody else um, over time. And even, you know, even the people who listen to the podcast and aren't patrons and are, who are practicing hard, I really hope you guys pass this stuff on to somebody else. Uh, shamanism has to reinvent itself for every generation. And we talked about this a little bit on the podcast as well. People were saying, asking things like, is it okay if I do an event? And is it okay? Of course it is, you know. Do what you like. Mm. Shamanism's a, a, a creative thing. We're, we're playing with nature's energies within nature. So never, never, you never have to ask anybody's permission. But as far as woven energy is concerned, just crack on, get on and do it, you know, see what happens, learn from the experience, you know. It's um that's what the kind of thing that shamanism is. I deliberately haven't trademarked woven energy. I thought about it, but I have deliberately haven't trademarked it. Um, because it's it's really the whole thing is it's a description of what we're about. The universe is a pattern of energy. And, you know, at one time that would have sounded woo-woo until, you know, modern physics came along and now it's pretty obvious, uh, you know, seemingly the only things that that have any kind of mass at all in the energy, in in the universe under the current understanding within physics are quarks and things like that. And they have very, very little mass to speak of. So the vast majority of everything is actually energy, including what we interpret as mass, uh, as, as matter, if you like. And, you know, going, going back to Einstein, the E equals MC squared just says it all, doesn't it? Uh, if he mm. really was this genius, he wouldn't have told anybody about that, would he? Because, you know, C is a very big number. And what happens when you square a very big number? Um, you know, uh, it, it's a this number. Is, this is just... Just going back to the sickness a second, this is a, a simplistic kind of thought. So all things considered, but it's an interesting thought. I, I was thinking like, is it is what we call the shaman's sickness, quote unquote, like nature's way of, of sprinkling potential shamans mm. into the world. Um, I, and it's it's nature's way of making sure that this fundamental and essential integral part of yeah what it means to be human is, is it there. It is. It's nature. It's part of, not all of, because nature has many ways of doing that, of which the shaman sickness is only one. And as I've said, it's not the only one. And I believe it's possible to become a great shaman without ever undergoing shaman sickness. At least you wouldn't call it shaman sickness when somebody who's solid on level one, solid on level two, solid on level three, solid on level four, they stop practicing level five, six, and seven. You would never call it a sickness because it doesn't make them ill. Do you follow what I mean? They, they, mm. they're, they've got tremendous bat. They've got tremendous toshal teen. They've got tremendous guhuk. They are more than able to deal with that stuff when it comes along in their training. So you, you couldn't really call it a sickness. They do go through the same stuff, but they're well able to not be distracted by it, to, to plow on and be directed in the shamanic technique. But yes, I believe that nature, uh, in terms of, uh, for instance, just in terms of genetics, nature throws up a number of anomalies deliberately. Uh, and, you know, this is to do with genetic mutation and stuff like that. Nature throws up a number of anomalies deliberately in order to keep the development of life and non-life. This is two in terms of geology and and. Uh, cosmology and all that kind of stuff, to, to keep it flexible, mm. it, to keep it plastic, to keep it relevant, and to ke keep its ability to adapt to new things. If that stuff didn't happen, for instance, in genetics, you know, what a dull world that would be. We would all be almost carbon copies of each other or carbon copies of our parents and stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. This, is, this is not good. And it's not just in terms of, actual mutation of genes that's the rarer thing you also get dominant and recessive genes you get complex patterns of genes so when that's how you end up not being just a straight copy of your half your one what your father and half your mother that that's how it happens because genetics is more complicated than that very interesting subject if anybody wants to look into it right up until you start getting into biochemistry and then it gets hard but anyway never mind um <laughs> but the which incidentally we talked about a bit of biochemistry at the gathering of the tribe as well. That I, I think that was cool because I mean that that was the opening lecture called the scientific basis of shamanism. We've said we've talked about this a lot of times. I don't like the word basis, incidentally. I think the scientific explanation of shamanism would have been a better title. 
because it's not the base of sham- is shamanism. The scientific explanation of shamanism, I, I was pleased to have the opportunity on the in the lecture format with you know slides and evidence I can show in pictorial form that that what we've been saying about there being nothing supernatural about shamanism. And we we got into quite some detail on things like biochemistry on that mm. on that lecture. And that lecture is available already inside Patreon, incidentally. Uh, and it was nice to be able to do that at long last. I mean, we've talked about it so many times on the podcast that there's nothing supernatural here. It's all explainable by science. And actually, a lot of it has been explained by science, despite the way some people act. You know, uh, that that lecture covered the supposedly mystical subject of internal energy in quite a lot of biochemical detail, uh, just to show that this stuff has already been worked out. And, you know, the, all these people, these pseudoscientists who are looking for what she is or looking for where she is, uh, I'm afraid, sorry, you, there's a whole bunch of genius chemists and biologists that have beaten you to the draw, guys, I'm that afraid. Have, that have worked it out. <laughs> <laughs> worked yeah. it out long ago, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, so, we talked about that in, um, I believe, yeah. just before stage two, because, you know, if anybody's interested, if you go back to, gosh, now I'm testing myself, probably around the episode 16 mark, we started talking about the Amscar and stage two, but we did a few episodes leading up to it talking about the science and That's right. ATP and, you know, all this kind of... Um, yeah, the electron transport the chain and all that kind of stuff. But on this lecture yeah. also, we also did, I mean, I'll just give a couple of examples. Electron transport chain ATP was one in terms of internal energy. But the other one, uh, briefly, that I gave was the terpenes, the language, the chemical language that trees use to communicate with things that aren't trees, including shamans. Uh, but also how, in in chemistry terms, trees talk to clouds, for instance, to make it rain. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, all of that stuff would have been woo woo and mystical. Probably in some people's minds, it still is. Uh, but however many rain dancers and human shamans do, and it doesn't rain. Tr- trees are always way better at humans as sh- than humans at shamanism. Uh, they're well mm. able to make it rain. And we go into that on the lecture as well. In, in scientific terms, how they manage to do that. It's very interesting. Um, so, so yeah, so that's that's the traditional model of the, the, the shaman and their apprentice. And then there's a few other models. There's the um, the model where, you know, somebody who's very honest and gets the idea of chalicity and and just goes out into nature and, and just plunges into it and is very honest with themselves and tries to sub, su- constantly to suppress their own imagination and just allows over a long period of time nature to to teach them directly uh, without a guide. That's also possible. It's a very hard way to do it because one of the advantages I found with my guides in life is is, you know, you think you're getting somewhere and your guy can just turn around and tell you, no, that's your imagining it, mate. You know, uh, that's well, so I, useful. That's but so also, useful. Also, you know? It's so, so easy because, uh, you know, back, back when, when I first started doing this stuff, it was, it struck me how quick that this imagination trap can come upon you because just by laying down and doing a bit of quote-unquote meditation, and I know that's a... <laughs> a, a, a a, uh, a term we don't particularly subscribe to, but just sitting down, trying to clear the mind. If you do that for a little bit, you will start seeing stuff. And yeah. I was seeing, I was seeing shapes. I was seeing all sorts of colors and contour and like, and like the, behind my eyelids, a whole yes. world started to Which develop. is fine. Now, as long as you don't try and interpret it in miasmatic terms, as long as you don't try and interpret it at all, it's fine. It, the problem is that yeah. the propensity to interpret it. That's that's. But the it propensity. just struck me as it struck me that it's so quick. It happens so quick, and, mm-hmm. it, and it's like people can get sucked into those aspects that will happen when you start learning shamanic technique, or you even just scratch the surface by quote unquote yeah. doing a bit of meditation. You know, this stuff will happen, and, and so and it's like, how do you deal? I'm not. I mean, obviously, we know it's it's it's, it's the imagination trap. But it's like, how do you deal with that? How do you move? through yeah. that without yeah. letting that distract you but also it's also important to understand why that happens well, human beings are not typical animals now i don't want to have a sort of biblical adam and eve thing we're not atypical in that way we are not any different from other animals in that sense you know like adam and eve come along and 
and they are the ruling over the animals, and they're not animals kind of thing. I don't mean it in that way. What I mean it is this this whole thing with tool use. And again, we talked about this on the lecture, uh, how, you know, starting off the trees gives us certain av advantages. Uh, they need to visualize tools in order to be able to make them. We're not the only tool-making animals. Chimpanzees do it, orangutans do it. But th that ability to visualize makes us especially prone as a species compared to other species that don't particularly use tools. I mean, tigers use tools, but they come naturally. They don't have to do anything to get claws, right? They're just there. <laughs> There's nothing they have to do to acquire them uh, other than just like grow. So, so I think that it's important to understand that we're not, we're atypical. And this is why we've done this atypical thing that, that Terence McKenna is talking about in this song. Human history represents such a radical break with nature and the natural organization that preceded it. It's a radical break because we developed that ability to make tools. First of all, we developed the ability to physically make them with the opposable thumb because of tree climbing. Uh, you know, we, we started off in the trees and then came down from the trees, uh, which is a cool ability. We could then manipulate, we're good at manipulating things because of the, oppo the opposable thumb. And then our brains basically fused the bit of the brain that deals with visualization and the rest of the brain so that we can mm. start to visualize things that don't exist, that as if they do exist, like gods and, you know, monsters and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, imagine ourselves as something that we're not. Uh, like, you know, imagine ourselves as a powerful shaman where actually we have no ability whatsoever. You know, this type of thing, you see that a lot. We uh, There's a reason why we develop to be particularly prone to it. So what I'm saying is human beings are particularly prone to the imagination trap because of our nature of how we evolved. Uh, I mean, as a species, as a as a group of animals, with a particular outlook on the world, a particular genetic outlook on the world, we're particularly prone to that problem. Whereas I don't think you'll find uh, an animal like a swallow is particularly prone to the imagination trap. Yeah, There's no way they can be. I mean, they fly through my garden. It's just wonderful. I sit and watch them for hours, you know, taking those insects out of the air at high speed, making those amazing turns. Uh, it's mm. just phenomenal. If they weren't in a deep, deep state of chelicity, they would never be able to do that. I mean, that that there's no room for thought. They, <laughs> there's no they room, are just there's no room for chelicity central thinking. Is there? They are chelicity, and they're not the only animals that I do like swallows. Though, but they're not the only, and that's also it's a shingy animal, isn't it? You know, but they're not the only. And, and we will when we get on animal spirits. Will we ever be doing swallows at some point in time? Uh, you can look forward to that. The they are total masters of chelicity. Uh, and but they're not total masters of tool making. You don't want to yeah. get um, you don't want to get a, a swallow to do your flint napping for you. Um, so we talked about flint napping uh, on the uh, on the podcast on the uh, sorry the gathering of the tribe as well, uh, which is yeah. great. And we had uh, actually some uh, some semi expert input from from patrons. Greatly appreciated. Uh, and um, yeah, we, we have a. I'm, I'm not going to spoil the surprise, but we, we have a patron who we'd like to interview at some point in time on one of the podcasts, uh, who's a bit of an expert in that type of stuff. So, but I won't spoil the surprise just yet. Um, okay, so yeah, yeah, lovely. I do have one more question that may or may not annoy you. Oh, go for it, man. <laughs> Do you consider, I'm, I'm, there's a reason why I'm asking this, do you, do you consider Terence McKenna, as we've brought him up in this podcast, to be mm. a shaman or more of an animist? He's a super interesting guy. Oof. I mean, he's, he's a super interesting guy who is also, or was also, uh, a guy who was full of ideas, uh, mm. full of energy, uh, full of life, and... Can I tell you the reason why I asked that question yeah, first and then go and then you continue? So yeah. the reason I asked it is because having listened, having gone through all sorts with you, he's an enigma in my mind is Terence McKenna because of how much he is, he, he is adamant, you know, about the psychedelic experience and the, and, and the usage of said substances yeah. in order to gain insight. So I'm wondering, he has such a, visualization and a, and, a, and a clarity of mind as to what shamanism and animism is and the way he, he expresses mm. it is very visual. 
And I'm wondering, does that come from his use of psychedelics? And how do we square that with... Well, there's no problem squaring it. There's no problem squaring it. I mean, I've never denied that you can pursue shamanic technique using psychoactive substances. I've never denied that. I don't disagree with a lot of the stuff that McKenna says um, in terms of, uh, especially, I mean, for instance, my favorite work of his is the book called Food of the Gods. If you want a McKenna recommendation and you haven't read that amazing work, then do read it. Uh, there's there's hardly a word I disagree with in that book. What, what I, um, where, where people would see me as having a different position to him is in emphasis. His mm. emphasis, and it's no wonder he's a botanist, for goodness sake. You know, he's he's interested <laughs> in plants. And obviously that's the lens through which he sees everything, you know, saw everything. Um, and I don't blame him. And he has a totally legitimate view of shamanism. And was he a shaman? shaman? Sure he was. The only difference is that, you know, every shaman has a different way. They have to find their way to bring other people to this path. And the richness of his character is one of the things I'd like to stress. A lot of shamans end up like that. You know, you can see with me and the richness of my characters come in a different way. I'm I'm the martial arts collector, aren't I? You know, I'm Mm. also the spirit dance collector. I mean, for instance, for the first time ever, I did some, um, I mean, first time ever with other people, I did some Malay spirit dance on the gathering of the tribe, along with the, the normal, you know, you know, I don't believe that spirit dance is, is anything to do with different countries, but some some spirit dance stuff that will come from the Malay tradition, I showed, you know, just, just to show that, you know, this thing is not the exclusive preserve of Mongolia and Japan, which you might get yeah. the impression, you know, if you see me talking about spirit dance normally. So the, the point is that shamans, because of the Toshal team thing, they end up with quite rich portfolios of technique if they do it for a long time. And, and Ted McKenna looked into a lot of different things skewed by his interest in plants and, and the psychoactive, I don't know, side foundation uh, aspect of shamanism. Um, and my interest has been heavily skewed by spirit dance. Uh, you know, I, we have this podcast on shamanism and we do talk about drum technique, and we've talked about other things. We've talked about homie look and various other shamanic techniques. We did some drum technique, and we're going to, uh, on the, the Gathering of the Tribe, but we're going to, the whole of the next Gathering of the Tribe is going to be on drum technique. But if you took this podcast as a whole, you would see that Damon has a a particular um, skew towards spirit dance, right? It's it's, And I would never deny that. Uh, it's my particular portfolio, portfolio of um, shamanic technique. So... But in a way, my spirit dance is McKenna's mushrooms. <laughs> That's probably the best yeah. way to follow out of me. Uh, yeah. the, the reason I like spirit dance is its richness, its variety. But also, in some ways, spirit dance gives you a path to bat, toshal, teen, and guk, but in, in terms of use of psychoactive substances, especially bat, it gives you a path to that that you are ready when you experience that stuff. And my worry about the psychoactive substances has always been out of sequence in terms of Mm. a person newly coming to the subject of shamanism, that advanced practice comes out of sequence and it ends up making them think that they are doing shamanism when, in fact, they are doing amplified imagination trap, amplified, of course, by the psychoactive substances. Yeah, so that's my worry. Mm. But, mm. but you surprised? I mean, we could do a review of that book, Food of the Gods. I do love it. It's one of my favorite books ever. Um, and um, it, it it's just such a special book, and it describes the miasma. The only literary work that describes the miasma better than that is The Chemical Wedding. <laughs> it's the only one. Um, yeah, which yeah. which needs deciphering in and of itself. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we, we started out on <laughs> day two on heretics. There was one. Uh, so yeah. many people asked us for so long to start on day two on heretics, and we have actually started. So we'll be, we'll be getting moving on with day two shortly. But it is a really great book. And so, yeah, I recommend that book to anybody. And it's... I think it frustrates a lot of people around me. They can't understand why I have such a reverence for McKenna 
when I seem to have such vehement disagreement with them. But the disagreement is kind of superficial. That's probably the way, from my point of view. Uh, yeah. If we did get together, the, the, we would have a far more in common, I think, than you than you might expect. That's uh, that's my view. Yeah, uh, and and what a wonderful person, you know, and and his yeah. output uh, inspired me among many others. Um, I remember yeah. back back when we were there was a period of about a year where we did so much housework here it was ridiculous but um, one of the things that got me through it was just listening to Terence McKenna on repeat um, you know like there's lots of videos on YouTube of him just just literally talking for hours and you just get wrapped up in it he's such a such a good orator um, so yeah. So, I mean, but there are dangers to that as well. You can't do it all on the baseline, as you know. You can't do the stuff oh, all yeah, on the baseline. Yeah. It's not I good enough to, to read away about. from painting. And time. I think that is the one thing that we have harped on about, probably like a stuck record since the beginning of this podcast that I'm quite pleased <laughs> about, is just thinking about this stuff, just listening to a podcast, just reading books, just all I can thinking about in your head. You've got to practice. You've got to go out and do it, and you've got to headbutt nature, as we've said many times. The idea that the solution to anything is some kind of baseline ratiocination is a really bad idea, uh, when, especially when it comes to spiritual kind of subjects, because spiritual subjects are top-line subjects, right? They're, they're mm. upper-world subjects. They're not underworld subjects. So... It's it's important to keep this in mind when I'm recommending books and stuff. I'm just recommending it as a good book that will give you some insights into the development of shamanism over time, uh, and and to give it, help to give a, a broaden out the picture of what the miasma is. This miasma thing that we keep talking about, but it isn't going to help you become a shaman at all. <laughs> it's not. You've got to practice for that. Um, mm. But seeing the progress of our patrons of the Gathering of the Tribe, as I said earlier. It's a it's it's a joy to me. The answer to the question, you know, if you'd asked me back in 2013, then if it was 2013, can you learn shamanism from a podcast? If Joe asked me that, then he did, wasn't asking me that. He was just saying, "Can we do a podcast? <laughs> can mm -hmm. we?" And the next time we see him, can we do a podcast and, and so on? Uh, would it be an affirm? No, uh, I'm not so sure anymore. I'm not so sure about that anymore. Well, it was due to your Toshel team that we've that we did it. You know, mm -hmm. ah, what's to lose? Let's let's play, yeah, exactly. let's do it, let's experiment. Exactly. Ah, let's throw throw it out into the world and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, been absolutely brilliant as this episode. Um, anything else you want to add, or should we should we wrap it up? No, just to thank our patrons once again. Uh, you mm -hmm. guys brighten up my world. Uh, thanks ever so much. Excellent. Yep. And of course, just to reiterate, you can come and join us on Patreon uh, and of course, get access to the previous uh, Gathering of the Tribe, which is included in there uh, and any future future posts that, um, that we put up. So thanks a lot for listening and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs>